All right, sports fans. Good morning. Uh, we're going to do, this is the first in a series of lectures on life cycle models uh, and basically the part of the course that we're going to talk about using process. So let's get started. Uh, the references come from a lot of the books that are in the library, including McConnell's book on uh, Code Complete, uh, Spolsky's book, which is very good, the Rainwater book, uh, Brooks's book on the, the um, uh, right, Mythical Man Month, uh, and then Chapter 2 from the textbook. So that's where that comes from. All right, so software life cycle. So the software life cycle uh, is something that every program has. And what does it have? Every program, no matter how big it is, has conception. You have an idea for the program. Somebody has an idea. Once you have an idea, you have to figure out what it is you're exactly going to do. That's requirements gathering, exploration, modeling, those kinds of things. Once you think you know what you're going to do, you have to design it. You then write the code. And since none of us is perfect, you'll have to debug it as well. Uh, then you'll have to do testing. Testing and debugging are different, although they tend to typically overlap, particularly unit testing. Uh, once you are satisfied that everything's done, you'll release the product. Uh, you, it then enters the maintenance and software evolution phase where you might add new features and you fix bugs that escaped from the testing the first time. And then lastly, eventually it retires. Uh, because you don't need it anymore, there's a new version, or there's a new type of software that does something better. Okay, uh, so the life cycle. Uh, the phases may overlap, particularly for smaller programs. Uh, they may merge. Uh, so you may do design and coding at the same time, basically. Um, and for small programs, you may not even realize that you're doing one or more of the phases. You really may not even really think you're doing debugging uh, and testing when you are. Uh, but you will do all of those phases for every single program you write, including just programs for uh, classes. Uh, so um, life cycle models. Uh, every life cycle model that we will talk about is a variation on two fundamental types. The first one is where you do a complete life cycle, and that is you do steps two through seven, uh, and then you're done. Uh, sometimes you do start again, particularly if you have another version, uh, but that's the typical one. Uh, and then, or you do a partial life cycle, which is usually do steps three through five, uh, creating a prototype or what's known as an iteration. And then you do it again, having re clarified requirements and done some testing. Uh, and then uh, keep doing that until you're ready to release. So that's it. All life cycles are basically one of these two kinds. First kind's called really plan driven or development driven. Uh, and the second kind is usually called an iterative model. So we'll talk about both of those. So what kinds of models are there? Well, the first one is called the uh, code and fix model. Uh, in this case, what you have is you have an idea, or in your cases, mostly you have an assignment for program. You then immediately sit down at your, type, at your uh, computer and you start typing. Uh, and you write some code, and you compile it, and it doesn't work, and you try it again. And you, when it finally does compile, uh, you uh, start executing it, and it doesn't work, so you have to fix it. Uh, and you go through this little loop here, thunk, 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 a bunch of times, and eventually it works to your satisfaction, and then you release it. Poof, gone. Uh, prayer being optional, because this is a very ad hoc kind of a model. Um, this is often used instead of actually having project management. It's often used when you have one person writing a program. Uh, there's no formal requirements, no documentation, no QA, no testing, nothing. Um, it works OK for quick and dirty things, like if you're going to do a proof of concept thing. Uh, it certainly works OK if you're, only, it's a, if you're just going to release it once and then forget about it. Um, it works well for single person projects, but if you want to do anything bigger, or if you ever want to actually sell it, or if you ever want to have another version of it, this is a very dangerous model to use. Don't do it. Okay. 
Uh, model number two, the classic waterfall. This is what a waterfall looks like. It has a series of stages. If, if I was a better artist, I would actually draw a waterfall uh, as you go down, down. The idea is that you have these different phases of development, and you must complete the current phase before you can move on to the next phase. Um, so... This was one of the first models ever used. A guy named Royce uh, talked about it at an IEEE conference back in 1970. Um, and uh, it covers all of the major software development activities. If you recall the diagram on the previous slide, it looks a lot like all of those life cycle uh, steps that we talked about. Uh, it's based on software development being sort of an and assembly line development, or what's called BDUF, which is big design up front. Uh, and uh, the assumption, as I said earlier, is you finish phase N minus one before pr proceeding to phase N. There are little, there is little or no communication among the life cycle phases. So once you're done, you're done. You just move on. Uh, it works kinda. For no, if you have known requirements and known technologies, it works kinda if you have a weak or inexperienced staff because there's lots of structure to this model and uh, lots of structure will help a, a, an inexperienced staff move along. Um, it works if you have really good requirements and if nothing changes. Uh, the problems with the classic waterfall model are it's very rigid if used religiously. Um, it's nearly impossible to define requirements adequately up front. Uh, change happens. Um, and there are a few signs of ongoing process. If you are the customer, you don't see anything until the very end. And the very end could be months away. Uh, and so that makes many, many, many customers very nervous. Um, there's no useful data on progress until the implementation phase. So there's documents that, that, that flow from one phase to another, but you generally don't see any code working until you get to implementation. So uh, the classic waterfall model is, is best when used for brand new products or if you're doing a major renovation of an existing project. Um, it's not good for incremental stuff at all. It's not good for small stuff. Uh, and I spent ooh, somewhere between 15 and 16 years in the software industry writing code and managing other people who wrote code, and I never once saw a classic waterfall model succeed in practice. Yeah, those kinds of projects were always late. They always cost too much money. Uh, and it's because you, you can't back up. You're, everything's supposed to be perfect, and the world doesn't work that way. But it's a good theoretical model. Okay, so if you're not going to do waterfall, what are you going to do? Well, what you're going to do is iterate. So uh, the best practice is to iterate and deliver incrementally where you view each iteration as a closed-end mini-project. So what you do is you gather up a set of requirements, you prioritize them, you estimate how long they will take, and you slice off the requirements somewhere and go to work. And when you're done with those requirements, you deliver something. Uh, and, you know, you keep doing that until you get enough to actually release the product. Uh, that's how iteration works. So you iterate and deliver incrementally. Each iteration is a closed-end project. Uh, the important part is you have to rank the features and the requirements by business value. How important is this to the delivered project? And you only work on the highest priority features in each iteration. Okay. Um, so you rank all the, the features by uh, business value. You plan to build the highest priority and remaining features. Uh, the finished system only consists of high return on investment features. Um, 
The advantage to this is at the end of every iteration you have something that works so that if you if the project gets canceled early before the entire system is done you still have something that it's possible to deliver to the customer. Uh, so the basic rule is uh, your project has a binary deliverable. You actually have to deliver code to somebody. And on the date when your schedule says you're supposed to deliver, it's binary. One of two things happens. You either deliver a system that's accepted by the user or you don't. Uh, and then everybody knows what happens on that day. Uh, to make this a little more specific for the iteration, the iterative rule, um, you divide the project into component pieces and then each activity must be defined by a deliverable with objective completion criteria. And the deliverables are demonstrably done or not done on the day that they are scheduled. Uh, that's the idea. The, this is getting us slowly to the point where we have the realization that what you're delivering is code that's supposed to work for the customer. Okay, and so the key to iterative development comes from uh, Fulgram's book from the late 1980s, which is all I really need to know I learned in kindergarten, which is live a balanced life. Learn some and think some and draw and paint and sing and dance and play and work every day some. Or, if you're a software developer, you analyze some and design some and code some and test some every day. And that's how you end up with code. Uh, okay, that's it for now. Uh, next video will come up shortly. Uh, thanks a lot. Take care.